welcome to this episode in which we're going to continue answering questions brought in biology. You're going to be with me, Munir Mustafa. We're still continuing with the Form 3 syllabus. So without wasting any time, let's start with the questions. Our first question states that define tropism, question A. So a question like this just requires someone to define, to give the meaning and a bit of understanding on tropism. So we can answer it by saying tropism is the type of movement or plant growth towards or against a sim stimulus. So when talking about tropism, we're just talking about any type of movement or plant growth which is directed towards or against a stimulus. So for a tropism to occur, it should react to a certain stimulus. It can be either positively, that is towards the stimulus, or it can be negatively, against any stimulus. For example, we have phototropism in which the growth occurs either towards light or against light. Moving on to our second question, we are told to state the biological importance of hydrotropism and phototropism. So here we are told to state the biological importance of two types of tropisms. That is hydrotropism and phototropism. So in answering a question like this, the student should have a complete concept on those two terms. Once the student has the concept on these two terms, they can answer the question rather easily by asking themselves, due to these two things, that is hydrotropism and phototropism. What, why is it important for an organism to have these two things? So beginning with hydrotropism, we can say that, first of all, the meaning of hydrotropism, which is hydrotropism is the movement or plant growth towards or against water. So hydrotropism is basically directed towards water. Hydrotropism is important to organisms as being positively hydrotrophic or negatively hydrotrophic, which can help organisms to gain nutrients or protection, first of all. So hydrotropism is important for someone or for an, any organism to gain either nutrients or to gain protection that is, some of them use water as a source of nutrients and others use water as a source of protection for them. For instance, in plants, the roots are positively hydrotropic, which means it grows towards where water is located so that it can gain water for nutrients use. So a plant root can grow towards a source of water, which is anywhere. Or you can see in seedlings the radical. The radical grows towards water sources. And also phototropism is the movement or plant growth towards a light stimulus. So phototropism comes from the word two words. Photo, which means light, and tropism, which means movement. So... Phototropism is actually any type of movement or plant growth which is directed toward light stimulus. So some, of, some organisms are positively phototropic while others are negatively phototropic. But phototropism is important to organisms such as plants as they need an adequate amount of light for photosynthesis. So, some plants or all plants need enough light for photosynthesis to occur. That's why they are positively phototrophic. That is, whenever they grow, they grow towards a position where they can gain maximum light for photosynthesis. 
So it shows that plants, for instance, the sunflower, the sunflower, the sunflower always faces the sun. Wherever the sun is, the sunflower faces the sun. The other plants in which the leaves, the leaves are directed in such a way that they gain maximum sunlight. So plants show positive phototropism. Moving on to our second question, we are told to state any five functions of the skeleton. So a question like this is straightforward. It just needs someone to mention what are the functions of the skeleton. We all know what a skeleton is or how the structure of the skeleton is. What is needed is just to mention the functions of the skeleton. So you can answer it just by using a bullet based answer just like this and which we can see or oh, we can see how it is answered. For instance, first of all, to support the body. So one function of the skeleton is to support the body in such a way that the body should not fall down. For instance, if for instance a human being, so if human beings did not have the skeleton, then they would have not shape, have any shape, they would not be able to stay stable, that they would not be able to stay even straight. So the skeleton acts as a support for the organism. Also to provide protection to delicate organs and tissues. Due to the fact that the skeleton is made up of hard bones, the skeleton has also a job of protecting delicate organs from either injury or shock. For instance, the brain is encased inside the skull, the heart and lungs are encased by the ribs, in such a way that the bones or the skeleton protects or provides protection against injury for these delicate organs which would have been very, very problematic if anything happened to them or if any damage happened to those organs. Locomotion. So also the skeleton functions as an anchor for muscles in which when muscles contract and relax it can help with the movement. So another function of skeleton is to aid in locomotion. Another one is storage of minerals such as calcium and phosphates. So the skeleton does not only have the function of being a support system or a locomotion system or even a protection system, but also it provides a storage place for very various minerals such as calcium minerals in which these strengthen the bones and teeth also we have phosphates which have nearly the same function and many other minerals which are stored in the bones also we have the manufacture of red blood cells that is it's found in the bone, bone marrow so red blood cells the skeleton also has the function of manufacturing red blood cells which provide oxygen or which transport oxygen throughout the body in the blood. So these red blood cells are manufactured in the bone marrow. So due to this the skeleton also has a function as a manufacturing site. So to cap it all off we can see that the functions of the skeleton can be to support the body, to provide protection to delicate organs and tissues, locomotion, storage of minerals such as calcium and phosphates, and the manufacture of red blood cells, which is found in the bone marrow. Moving on to our third question. 
we're told to show the location of the following joints. The hinge joint, the ball and socket joint, the pivot joint, and the gliding joint. So in a question like this, what is required is to mention what type of, or which bones, or which part of the body has these types of joints. And we know that the joint is any area which, which is between two different bones. So between two different bones, that is called a joint. So we have four types of joints here. The hinge joint, the ball and socket joint, the pivot joint, and the gliding joint. To answer a question like this, you have to know what are these joints or what or how do these joints work. For instance, a hinge joint works in only two directions, that is upwards and downwards. While the ball and socket is universal, that is it works in all directions. The pivot joint works by going side to side, while the gliding joint glides only, shows a sliding motion. So in asking yourself what part of the body can do these motions, for instance, in the hinge joint we can get, we can get a picture that the elbow works for the hinge joint. This is because the elbow only works by going up and down the elbow point. While the ball and socket, we have the knee, we have the hips, and we have other parts of the body in which can work more in more than one direction. Also, we have the pivot joint. The pivot joint, we all know that only one part can move from side to side, and that is the neck can move side to side, from one side to the left or to the right, but moving the neck up and down is very difficult. Also, we have the gliding joint in which the shoulder and spines work perfectly as the shoulder and spine joints tend to slide on each other. Moving on to our fourth question we have, we have, we're told to mention types of muscles, the types of muscles found in the body. So we all know that the body is made up of muscles, after bones, but there are three types of, there are mainly three types of muscles. You have to know which types of muscles are found in the body. So here the question asked, the answer required is to just state the types of muscles here. So we can now, uh, there are the three types of muscles in which first we have the skeletal muscle or we can call it voluntary muscle or striated muscle. This type of muscle works and is found in the skeleton and other joints in which work by the brain. I mean that the voluntary muscles work within the conscious of the individual. That is, the individual is conscious of them working. We have the smooth muscle or involuntary muscle, which is found in most internal organs, such as the alimentary canal, and so on and so on, in which the involuntary muscle works without the person's conscious. That is, they work automatically, involuntary, without, without the consciousness of the individual. And we have the cardiac muscle. The cardiac muscle is a special type of muscle which is found in the heart only. So in the heart only, this type of muscle is created and has a nucleus, but one or one distinguishing characteristic is that it never gets tired. So the cardiac muscle is a type of muscle found in the heart which never gets tired. Moving on to our final question for the day, we're told to define the following terms. So we have a few terms here, and we are asked 
to define them. Like I said before, defining something means you give your knowledge on what the thing is. So for instance, we are told to define the following terms. We have movement. First of all, movement and locomotion, the first two. Movement and locomotion are two words which are often mixed together, in which a person thinks that movement is locomotion and locomotion is movement. But we know that all locomotions are movements, but not all movements are deemed as locomotion. So a movement is nothing but the change in position or posture of an organism. The change can occur in many ways. It can be internally or it can be externally. So any change in posture or position of the organism is known as movement. So the, move, the organism can be sitting right there, but it can deemed or it can be seen to be moving as it changes its posture, even though it stays in the same position but it can change its posture, that is, it can look from left, it can look from the right, it can turn back, it can turn forward, that is movement, but it's not locomotion. While locomotion is the self-powered patterned motion of limbs or other anatomical parts by which an individual moves from place to place. So, we can see that locomotion is the self-powered patterned motion of limbs. So locomotion is nothing but the pattern motion of limbs or other anatomical parts. That is, it can be the cytoplasm, it can be flagella, it can be anything else. But the individual should move from place to place. So that is what locomotion is. First of all, it should be self-powered. That is, the organism itself should move. It should use its own energy. Also, the limbs or other anatomical organisms or ana other anatomical parts should actually have a pattern in movement. So the movement should be patterned. The motion should be in a pattern, in a certain pattern. And the individual should move from place to place. That it's, it moves from one place to the other. That is what locomotion is. And we have response. So we can ask ourselves, what is a response? A response is nothing but a reaction by an organism to a specific stimulus. So when an organism shows any type of reaction towards the stimulus, that is what's called a response. So a response is nothing but any reaction towards a stimulus. That is what response is. It can be either a negative response in which it moves away from it, or it can be a positive response in which it moves towards it. It depends, but all is known as a response. Also, and finally, you have anastic movement. Anastic movement is the type of movement or plant growth that is not oriented towards the stimulus. That is, it does not depend on the stimulus, any anastic movement. So the anastic movement does not orient towards or against the stimulus. It just occurs to the organism itself. For instance, in plants we have what we call figmonasty. That is, anastic movement towards touch. The plant Mimosa pudica is seen to close its leaves when touched, but it does not close it le its leaves towards the stimulus or away from the stimulus. It just closes its, it le its leaves. So the Mimosa pudica shows anastic movement in which it does not orient either towards or against the stimulus. So that's what anastic movement is. That is all for today. I hope you enjoyed our question and answer session for today. Join us next time as we continue to look into common questions which are brought in the biology syllabus. You are with me, Munir Mustafa Hamid, and from all around me, 
Thank you very much and have a good day.